Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rani Bhatt. Uh, it's my privilege and uh, pleasure on behalf of the Center of Local Governance at Princeton Plan University to uh, welcome you here today. We are delighted to have you with, uh, uh, with us to participate in the impactful uh, lecture by Fred Kent, uh, who is a global pioneer and thought to be a thought leader, uh, uh, revitalization, uh, uh, city, space, through community engagement. Uh, a founder of Project and Public Spaces, PPS. Uh, he is known throughout the world as dynamic speaker and man of uh, polycific ideas since 1975. Uh, Fred has worked uh, on thousands of projects uh, uh, all over the world, uh, including the Bryant Park, Rockefeller Center and Times Square in New York, uh, also in a citywide placemaking campaign in Chicago. Uh, today, Fred is applying his community organizing skills to lead uh, global placemaking place uh, skills uh, to lead global placemaking movement called Placemaking Leadership Council that is connecting and supporting public space innovators, advocates, and professionals uh, across the globe. The Center for Local Governance has partnered with FRED uh, to launch placemaking initiative for uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which uh, we started this week with uh, three public spaces uh, in the central area of Riyadh. So, without further delay, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Fred Kent. Uh, this is fun for me. Uh, I've really become very fond of Saudi Arabia and, uh, and the Saudis. I mean, this is our third time here. And uh, you have a very special way of using public spaces that is really, you don't see in other parts of the world. And I happen to think it's incredibly innovative and very creative. Um, here's my clicker. And I would say that uh, you're amazingly innovative, and when you look at something like this, I don't know if this is going to work, but there's a video, and you know what goes on here. The people bring everything they need to make the public space work for them, and, uh, and it's really fantastic because they want to make the best use of the space, and they want uh, to be part of a much larger sort of activation of those spaces. Uh, most public spaces are designed, well, like the plaza out here. Everything is designed for you to do something in it, in a sense, the way they want you to do it. Uh, these, the public spaces that we've been looking at are ones where people come in and make it the way they want to use it, the way they want to use it. So that's, it's very, very important. But you put the two together and you start to begin to get uh, a complexity that allows more ways of using it without taking away that special way that, that many people in your culture use it. So we've been working on this, uh, while we've been here, we've been working on this King Abul Aziz Historical Center with the National, this is one of the most incredible complex of institutions that I've seen anywhere in the world, but it is also one of the least used. And bringing that into a high level of use is a very big opportunity. Because this, this along with, uh, well, along with, uh, where we, we get down to Alpha Park, you know, there's a library there. You could go by that a hundred times and not know that it was a library. So the whole idea of bringing these buildings and these places alive, this is here, the heart of the city of, of Rio. And uh, moving down to Al Fatah Park, and then even down to uh, Salam Park, 
is a kind of a historical uh, walkway or a way of connecting all of these uh, so that they all become part of the center of Riyadh and, and can define the future of Riyadh. So uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, this is the placemaking workshop that we've been doing here, and then uh, this is the game that we did, and the numbers of people that came to the game uh, and were interested in doing it. In fact, some of the kids actually started bringing other kids over and telling them how to play this game and do this and get this interaction. So it was really a fabulous um, way of, of interacting with people. And many people I don't think had ever really had that opportunity before to be asked what they'd like to do with this. So, uh, so I'm going to start, but I want to also first of all introduce Kathy Madden, who has been my partner and, and one of the founders of PPS. And she's been really, she's, her skills are looking at a place and understanding how to make it work better. She has a design background, but she also has a kind of hotel background. And if you know about hotel people, they're always trying to make the place more comfortable for people, for people to be able to know where they are and how they can actually use the place better. So she sees design as function and comfort and those kind of qualities. So the book that she really put together is called How to Turn a Place Around. And I, I think we're working out an arrangement where this could be translated into Arabic. Uh, and then Arabic uh, uh, projects can then be put in here in place of some of the projects that are from other parts of the world. So what I'm going to talk about today is this idea of small spaces. Uh, and you can see the multiplier effect is tremendous. Uh, it's not just the number of people using them, but the larger number who pass by and enjoy them vicariously, or even the larger number who feel better about a city center for knowledge of them. For a city, such places are priceless, whatever the cost, and they're built at a set of basics, and they're right in front of our noses if we will look. So that is the basic idea of placemaking. Uh, and so that when you come to Riyadh, you're going to think of all these places in your neighborhood, wherever you are, or think of it as a city of a whole. And those places that we're working on here, and this university and others, are the places that people should have the memories of, the places that feel sacred and important to them. So uh, we're always saying that you need to turn everything upside down to get it right side up, to get from inadequate to extraordinary. And the reason we say that is most of the systems that we've set up deliver outcomes that is defined by their discipline not by what the community and people in the community think. And I'll show you what I mean by that as we go through this. So uh, I got started a long time ago, and this person that I work with, William White, uh, handed me a camera, a time-lapse camera, one of those old-fashioned cameras. And I went out, and he told me to study the social life of this intersection in, in Manhattan. It's right next to, if you, if you know Manhattan, it doesn't make any difference, but right next to it is Bloomingdale's. I spent a day with uh, pickpocket detectives because uh, they told me, they, and when you go through a revolving door, uh, what happens? Uh, there will be two or three people working together, and when they see someone that's a target, uh, the, the person coming across the street at the target will bump into them. And as soon as they bump into them, then the other person will get whatever it is that they're, they're looking for. So there's a whole street life, and that's what I worked with, uh, with this William White on the Street Life Project, uh, studying people using public spaces. There's a wonderful film called City Life, City Spaces that uh, you should get and look at it. Uh, so anyway, uh, the other thing that happened here is that up, up here, there was a sort of an incidental store. And uh, outside the incidental store, there was a man selling wigs. And he paid the owner of the store, something like at that time $300, this was 40 years ago, a month to be able to sell his stuff outside the store. 
and then the rest, then and it also acts as a kind of a shill because people might stop there and then go into the rest of the store. So the dynamic of that little storefront is phenomenal. Now the other thing that happened that I found out here is that this is a bank, and right next to that bank is this store, and uh, there are thirty-seven thousand people going by that store every day. And so I went in and I asked the, the owner of the store, uh, you must like your location. And uh, he said, no. And I said, why? We have so many people going by. And he says, people, as they walk back by the bank, they start working faster. And it takes them two or three stores to get into a window shopping rhythm. So they, they're going fast and they slow down and, then, and they see the third window better than they see the first window. Then the other thing I did, I was looking at the day in the, day in the life of a wastebasket. And this wastebasket has a flat top. And, uh, uh, and it also, you see that right between the wastebasket and the lamppost is a, uh, is a space. So people can get out, here is someone's leaning on the car, but they can get out of that, the flow of pedestrians, which is very heavy. Uh, and, 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 and watch what's going on. But this window is also open. So the, the litter that got on the ground was not done by people, it was accidentally happened. But the thing also that happened is that this wastebasket has a throat about like that. And uh, a man in a suit came along with a newspaper and he stuffed it into the hole and it was sticking out. And about three minutes later, someone came along took it out and put it back in, he didn't want to read it. And then about two minutes later, someone else came along and took it away. So this whole little social, social life of that intersection is amazing. But then what happened, a man came along, had his briefcase, opened it up, and started working on the top of the wastebasket. And a few minutes later, this woman came running across the street, screaming at him and telling him, you can't do that, it's a wastebasket. You shouldn't. So, you know, just that little block had an amazing amount of things going on. And I'm sure there was a lot of stuff that I didn't see, but when you can see a lot just by observing. And that's the whole idea of what this is. The social life of small spaces, observing, seeing how they work, understanding, finding ways to have those happen in the public spaces is really what placemaking is about. And what your culture in these public spaces, like the, the, uh, the library downtown, uh, the way they use it is just fantastic. So they're making it their place. That is the ultimate placemaking. So you're doing it already. So, uh, so placemaking is a dynamic function, human function, an act of liberation, a staking claim, a beautification. It's true human empowerment. Uh, it's also people are deeply nourished by the process of creating wholeness. And that's a big idea, because we're all naturally inclined, wherever you are in the world, to want to be in a place where we feel good, where we feel whole. And so that is sort of the basic idea, that if we have some control, some ability in our lives to be able to make that happen, we feel good. So that's basically what it is. So now I'm going to go to a much more global level, and the whole idea of convergence around place, place is the basic fundamental idea and a powerful idea for shaping the future of this planet. When you think of place and how it can add to uh, arts and culture, how it can add to local food systems, how it can support, if you think about transportation as places, you don't think about it as just vehicles, you think about it as a series of places. And then how does transportation serve those? Is preservation, public health, local economy, community engagement, equity, architecture and design. So many of you, I think, are in the architecture school, perhaps. And, uh, and architecture, a, a place, is really, I have to say, a paradigm shift for the way we're doing architecture today. And in, in a sense, many of the places in that, uh, where the squares and the museum and the amusement park are all about architecture as icons. And as you begin to make that architecture of a place, it changes the whole dynamic of that. We'll go into that. So staying at this higher level, the kind of placemaking that we're looking at around the world is how do you create streets that are places, not just for traffic, 
How do you create architecture of place? How do you build uh, local markets, local economies? How do you create multi-use destinations? So instead of having a park or a library, just imagine the library that's, that's in that, uh, uh, I think it was King Abdul Aziz Library, I think. That, if that was a, a much larger uh, multi-use destination, just think what that could be. Supposing there was a market, supposing there were bookstalls out front, secondhand books, markets, uh, uh, a playground. All these things would bring that people to that building and then the life of that building uh, would come outside and it would be woven together with the library functions. It's not hard to imagine. And the same with the, the main library downtown. Uh, so just think of a park, a plaza, or a square as multidimensional instead of just one, a one-off type space of grass and trees. And then same with the community institutions. Uh, to me, there's no community institution. It's just the narrow idea, a health, a hospital, the library, uh, uh, the city hall, all of those can become multi-use and deeply important to people in, their, in the community. Uh, and then thinking about the city at eye level, human scale. How does that work for, for everyone? Place governance, which is the key part of the program for this center on, on local governance, is, is really a paradigm shift to think about governance as place-based, place-focused, place-led. That's, that's a paradigm shift. Uh, and then all of that adds up to resilient, sustainable, healthy communities, which then has a big impact on climate, which then helps to save the planet. Now, many of the climate people are just thinking about recycling and uh, low energy use and that kind of stuff, but very few people are thinking about the big impact that this can have if we shape our communities in a different way. So, these are the people that uh, I got into uh, working with and being with. William White, Margaret Mead, Jane Jacobs, Alan all of these people were seminal thinkers back in the 60s and 70s. And then what happened for the next 50 years is this, the disciplines became the driving force of change in, in our culture and in our systems of government. Uh, and, and they were the ones that started doing the master plans the, uh, uh, okay. uh, and, and all the planning studies so that each discipline has become its own audience. And it's their outcome that they want to deliver to cities, not the outcomes that people in communities will use. And a lot of that has happened here, it's happened all over the world. So these are the people that I'll talk about as we go through. So Margaret Mead said, uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I absolutely believe that. I've seen this. I, I've been a community organizer for over 50 years. Uh, the history that I have is about creating change, and change is occurring at a, late, a rate that I never, ever would have imagined would be possible. And then Jan Gale, who wrote a book, Life Between the Buildings, Nothing in the world is more simple or more cheap than making cities that provide better for people. Those are both absolutely true, and if we follow that advice, every community, every city in the world will change and evolve to be a better place. And then coming back to this, the Holly White, this is where I'm gonna focus on these kinds of things. And he was a writer that had a great way, of almost poetry of how he would write like he said, it's hard to create a space that will not attract people. What is remarkable is how often that has been accomplished. And that is still going on around the world. He, and uh, we say, it's hard to create a space that will attract people. What is remarkable is how seldom this has been accomplished. This is at Harvard University uh, in Cambridge, a place that we work on. So if you want to see, see the place with activity, put out food. Ice cream is a very big way of bringing people together. And it's fun to go and observe people in, at ice cream stands because they often get ice cream together and they start eating it together. 
And uh, the only problem with this guy here is out of sync with these. Uh, and this is, these are uh, french fries, but uh, it's really fun to watch that. So I really encourage you to do that because you'll see a lot of other things at the same time. Uh, but now this is uh, the most unusual picture you will ever see in your life because the only person that does not have ice cream <laughs> is that little kid. So I said, oh my God, I gotta get another picture. So I took another picture and there he is. And looking at me, knowing that I know, he knows that I know that he's the only one doing it. So, so then, you know, one of the best things about water is the look and feel of it. It's not right to put water before people and keep them away from it. Right, absolutely right. Uh, and you know you can't keep people away from that, or that, or that. Uh, so this is an essential part of our lives, is to be able to have water to be able to do that. And then, very unusually, people take their shoes off when, they, when they're comfortable or hot. Uh, and so a sign of a good place is where people take their shoes off. Uh, and then, <laughs> this is a, benches are artifacts, the purpose of which is to punctuate architectural photographs. They're not so good for sitting. Now I'll get into that a lot because it's really quite profound. I mean, the architecture profession would like to have the building not disturbed by people. So they have these objects in front of them that, that make sure that, that people don't really want to sit there for very long because they're not comfortable. I'll show you that. And in fact, uh, this is in front of an iconic building in France. And you could probably time the longest person someone might sit there might be 10 minutes because it's cold, it's isolated, it's not a place to socialize. But in our neighborhood in Brooklyn, you know that, that it's always, people are always gonna be sitting there, people are gonna slow down, they're gonna stop, they're gonna go shop, they're gonna in, for a book, and they're gonna go look at the signs around the book. So if you have 10 of those places on a street, you're gonna have one of the most dynamic streets around. So if you get this, you'll have no one, and you get this, you'll get lots of people. So this is about the social life, it's about street life, it's about architecture of place, it's about all of these things that can have a profound impact on how we use and live in our community. And then, you know, a nine foot bench has a very different dynamic than a four foot bench. And you know that it's gonna be very hard for someone to go and sit here with that person. Uh, but if these people are here, that's okay. There's just enough room for people to come and sit together. And there's a big difference in what happens. And then, this is uh, in Germany, where even in the rain, if you have really comfortable seating, this is in, in a public space in, uh, I think, in Aachen, uh, that uh, people just brought their umbrellas to sit and enjoy. And then this is the, the world's best bench, where I think there are 18 people there, but there are probably about five or six groups of people that are sitting there, two people, three people, four people. The, it's two backsides deep, so you can sit here, sit here and here, uh, and there's a little place where, I mean, over here you can't see, but you can bring a wheelchair in. So we studied this bench, and I could spend 20 minutes showing you how it's being used in different ways. Uh, and then the idea of affection. Uh, and we, I used to think affection was all about kissing. And then I began to look, Kathy and I began to see that affection, there's so many ways of, of affection. Uh, and I may s say some things that you might feel a little uncomfortable with, but in some countries, eye contact is a big deal, especially the French. Uh, and then other places, you know, it's just the way you look at someone. Is, is a, a form of affection. Or just even, you know, just a slight touch or something. But you see it wherever you go. Uh, and when people are comfortable is when there's a feeling of completeness and wholeness where they can relate to someone else. So it's really, it's really a basic and we all, we all need that. Uh, and so these are three generations of women sitting on a bench in a public space. Giggling. That's, that's, Fantastic, and uh, you know when you get this situation where she's taken off her shoe and is rubbing her dog's stomach, that's pretty good, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, uh, and then this, uh, when I wanted to be kissed by her, but she would never kiss me, just 
me sitting there. So if I do that, and this other woman is going around uh, talking to the, this is in Buenos Aires, is talking to the street performers. So those sort of things that are going on are, are really about the life, uh, of community life. So uh, Jane Jacobs, uh, intricate minglings of different uses in cities are not a form of chaos. On the contrary, they represent a complex and highly developed form of order. So that's getting complexity is what makes our lives really interesting. So now this, sorry about the length of this, but this is basic. Uh, we don't have a welfare problem. What happened? Oh, I'm sorry, this is, oh, this is much better. Uh, so uh, architecture, how many of you are studying to be architects? Ooh, <laughs> okay, this is really good. If architecture is frozen music, okay, and urban planning is composition, placemaking is improvisational street performance. So as architects, if you just think of that your work is frozen music, this is where you gotta go. And this is where the future is. It's allowing the life to be part of the building instead of the building being the barrier to much of life. So that's a big paradigm shift. So this is, uh, this is a fellow who, if you have Visa, he was the founder of that. So he talks about, we don't have a welfare problem, an environmental problem, a crime problem, a climate change problem, a population problem, or an economic problem. And we don't have an educational problem. They are symptom, not disease. At the bottom, we have an institutional problem. Until we properly diagnose and deal with it, all societal problems will get progressively worse. So, there is simply no way to govern the diversity and complexity of 21st century society with separatist, specialist, mechanistic, 17th century concepts of organization. So, each discipline has become its own audience. So each of these, and I, we're all the same way, we've all become focused on developing skills in a discipline and then talking with other people in that discipline, building agendas around that discipline, supporting that discipline uh, to make sure that it has more impact on the communities. And every one of those is in a silo. So when you want to bring about change in a community, all those disciplines have to be involved in, in, in making that change. Uh, and so we're going to show you how to get out of that to silo dust, move away from that idea but still use the skills of those disciplines to support the future. So placemaking is not a discipline. It's fundamentally community organizing. It aligns the assets and aspirations of communities to create and define their future. And it becomes increasingly the places where we choose to live and work. It is a community process. It's natural, organic. It localizes its economic development. It's scaled to each community. It creates social and political capital. It's inclusive, equitable, healthy, sustainable, and viable outcomes. And if you take the word place, place making, and place governance, that's the new paradigm for city building. And it can mobilize entire communities, which is what the goal of the center is, uh, and cities to define their future, purpose and, and, and foundation of people's life. It creates ownership shared value, allows local wisdom and common sense to thrive. It's community-based, holistic, and inclusive, and positive outcomes can be enormous and done quickly. So that's the message of placemaking, and the whole idea of, uh, of place, place governance, and how it can change the future. It's the paradigm shift. So uh, Kathy and I are spending more time observing and uh, watching, and so we were in Munich, and uh, we saw this uh, tree guard, and, uh, and then we saw this, where we didn't know how that got there, but we went back a couple of times, because that really ugly bench, if you call it that, uh, was incredibly functional. It was absolutely amazing because on one side, someone had a juice bar, on the other side, someone was selling soup. So you see, they would come, 
sit there and have their drink, and they wouldn't be there very long. Uh, and then some people would come and watch, and other people would just come and have a wonderful time. So that little thing, they take it off at night and put it back at the beginning of the business day, and that had this dynamic, and there was many other things going on around here, little places that all added up for people to slow down, to, to, inter to interact, it was just an amazing place. It's, it could be a movie that you would be absolutely engrossed in. So I'm gonna go into this idea of design-led, because you're designers, and this should not happen again, what has happened in these places, to community program land. And they're in Toronto. Um, one is this place called Sherwood Common. Uh, it won both an architectural award and a landscape architecture award in, in Canada about six years ago, five years ago. And um, this is what won the architectural award. And maybe it won an architectural award because no one could figure out what it was. Uh, so it was a, just a piece of object. Uh, but it is actually a water filtration plant, in case you wanted to know. Uh, and then this is the playground that won the landscape architecture award. Uh, it's really an ingenious design with a, a row of black, black pebbles, a row of white pebbles. And then in each of these rows, was a particular thing like a bench or a, uh, this one. So we were there, Kathy and I were there, and we were there for about 20 minutes, and no one came except two, two couples came. And one with a little kid, and he came in running in, and he was really excited about being there because he wanted to move the black stones over to the white stones. So that was his idea of fun. Well, his parents had to move the stone back and they quickly left. And then the other thing that was so much fun is that there were, the next couple came with two children and, oh, and they wanted to go in the swings. Well, there are only there are two swings, but one swing is in one area of white pebbles and the other one is in another area of white pebbles. And uh, so this is, this is an ingenious design, uh, and, but no one ever can find a way to use it. So they left. And so this place has probably never been used by more than a few people a day. But you go somewhere else, and the idea of swings, uh, people come and gather, and because there's food and other things, you triangulate it, and you put four or five uses together, and all of a sudden you have people coming. So why is that other thing so stupid? I don't know, I can't think of a better word for it. But then, in that same town that did that Dufferin Grove, I mean that, uh, that Sherman Commons, uh, was this. This is a neighborhood with a park, and uh, some friend, a friend of ours uh, was pregnant, and she um, didn't know whether to get bored, <laughs> bored or, or, uh, uh, or scared, and she chose being scared. So she went into the park and started working with what they called toughs there, who were, had control over the park. And she got to the point where they actually uh, did a Portuguese bread oven and they started cooking together and doing pieces of bread and that kind of stuff and socializing around this place. So it became the gathering place for people in that community. They had uh, a lot of events that they had uh, and some people made a kitchen. The local community made a kitchen. Now this is not a park no park in the world has a kitchen looking like that. But people felt that they needed to come to a place where they could gather and have food together. And so that's what they did. And then they had this, they found this place to have a performance, um, which was basically a pathway between two hills. And that's where they would have their performance space. And then uh, for a playground, they built the best playground in the world of mud. And you know what kids like when they get around water and mud, and and, uh, and so this place is probably the best, one of the best youth playgrounds we've seen. But they also did other things. They took uh, a skating rink in the winter time, basketball courts, and other things, and they made it into their own place. So this became their uh, their place. Now, would you still call it a park? The parks department had no idea what to do because they had no control over what this community would do. 
So that was a paradigm shift and, and a way of rethinking about what are the parks that we have, the public spaces that we have. So now there's another one example that is really incredibly profound and in a way is, is very poignant for here, is Lincoln Center in New York um, and a Perth Cultural Center in Perth, Australia. We worked on Perth, but not on Lincoln Center, thank God. Um, so this is Lincoln Center. It's a really an iconic building, set of buildings in the center of New York, but it's all about iconic architecture. And uh, they have a place where you can sit under some trees, and that's all you can do there. And then they have this really ingenious building uh, with a green roof, sloped. And if you really want to have lunch there, you can't really have many people come. It's a very small uh, place because of the sloped roof. And where do you put the kitchen? So it doesn't get much visitation. And then you have this fountain, and you can't do anything around the fountain. But supposing you, instead of have, have a fountain, or a pool, water pool like that, but do this with flowers and chairs. It's not much difference, uh, but it's incredibly more impactful and usable. Or take this and turn it into that, and you've got an amazing piece of architecture, incredibly exciting, and you put the two together, and you've got an amazing destination. So one is all about award-winning, and you did win awards, and the other one is about creating a place that people want to be part of. So in Perth, uh, this was a, uh, uh, a collection of, of state university, state institutions for Western Australia. The state library was a very large building. And the woman who ran the state library took all of the library uses off the ground floor and moved them up in the or the first floor. And so the ground floor became a public square for people in, 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 during the hot weather, it got a lot of use all year round. Uh, so that's what it looked like. There, there were a lot of uh, brutalist buildings, like sort of iconic architecture of various buildings, and very little use. So we did a placemaking plan uh, and left, Kathy and I and someone else. We did this visualization of uses and activities that people came up with. And um, it was really fascinating because two years later we came back and they didn't do anything on the plan, which was actually perfect. And this is what happened. So here's before and after, before and after. And the special thing about this is the person who did this was a television personality who had a horticultural show and he got people to he got contributions to do this. So this was, again, owned by someone in the community. And, uh, and then this is basically a place where homeless people hung out. And they turned it into uh, a farm, farm kind of garden uh, place that people came to and used. And then this is the uh, art museum. And they turned this into a whole bunch of, of active functions. So this whole destination Became, it became the biggest destination in Western Australia just by doing this kind of activation. So why not start out with architecture that does this and places that do this so that then you are building a place, not just a building. So I, that's, it's really an exciting opportunity for architecture to be about people and places rather than just about iconic design and buildings. So then our favorite public space in the world there's one that only happens three or four months a year uh, in the summertime in Paris. And it's basically in an immigrant community, uh, mostly immigrant community in Paris. Uh, and, every, and everything is temporary. It's brought out, all the water features are temporary. Uh, these are pretty obviously temporary. They have game areas for kids, seating, uh, you know, really uh, very Comfortable seating is a, an important part of that. Uh, a big water feature and then this. And so that is just flooded with people every day from that whole, all those neighborhoods that make that one of the most special places that we've seen in any community. And, and one of the reasons where we see that as a really, something like that, or not just that, but that philosophy 
can really enliven the communities. The people here can still bring all the things they want to make their, their experience better, but with other things there added to it, it will magnify that dramatically. And if you have a library, just imagine what the library could do in the public space instead of just being the building in that space. So this is a big opportunity for the two libraries that we've been talking about. So the other thing is, and this is really a big issue everywhere in the world, but I think particularly uh, here, uh, when you design your community around cars and traffic, you get more cars and traffic. It's pretty obvious. And that's what everyone has done, okay? Uh, and so then you get into situations like this, where you have to get your friends together to get across the street. We actually call them a public display of affection because they were all scared and they were my grandmother's age. So it's not something you want your grandmothers to do is go stand in the middle of the street. Uh, but it was 800 feet from one block to the next and they wanted to get across. Uh, they did survive. Uh, and the mayor of uh, Sydney came to our office in New York and I gave him this picture. He said, I have no control over the traffic department. They answer to a different God. So watch out for traffic engineers. Uh, we say whatever a traffic engineer says, do the opposite, and you will be uh, building your community. Whatever they say, do the opposite, and you'll be building your community. And we got a job to train traffic engineers in doing just that. So when you design your community around people in places, guess what, <laughs> you'll get more people in places, but there's no agency that does that. It, there's no agency that really focuses on people and how they can be in their place. So Alan Jacobs, you probably don't know him, but if we can develop and design streets so that they are wonderful, fulfilling places to be, community building places, attractive for all people, then we will have successfully designed about one third of the city directly and will have an immense impact on the rest. So you don't ever look at a street again the same way, because they are not functioning for you, they're functioning for the car. And uh, one of our first examples that we worked on was in New Haven, where we're giving a talk at Yale next week, uh, that this was one of the blocks. Right behind it was Yale. So a friend of ours owned these buildings, and he turned it into that. But in the process of turning that into that, we widened the sidewalk, and we narrowed the lanes so that that corner became the gateway to Yale University instead of just another throughway going through Yale and came to that. So when we talk about the power of 10 on a street and we can create uh, public spaces like this that draw people into and, and that same rhythm, you can build it. And if you start in places like the intersection, because you know you're going right up against everything the traffic area uh, engineer wants is a better turning lane. Uh, to speed traffic through the intersection, not to slow it down. So when you do something like this, or this is incredibly unusual, to have a bench at the corner. I've only seen this in one place. Uh, and, and watching that bench, people don't watch cars, they watch other people. So, uh, or this in Buenos Aires, this was amazing. It was in a neighborhood, and uh, they had two two one-way streets with two lanes going. And when there was no people eating, it was fast moving. But then as people came for the meal, for lunch or dinner, it started to fill up. Here are the buses and the cars. Uh, and then uh, they're actually almost in the street. There are bollocks there and the curb is no, there's no curb. Uh, and then uh, someone comes along with, with uh, balloons and guess they can't walk on the sidewalk. So they have to walk in the street. And the whole street has now become a shared space. So that it becomes, the whole, it's now a square rather than just four corners. So that's a paradigm shift. And then what happens when you get a good place like this, you get these kind of curious people who are kind of like to be part of the, have be uh, paid attention to. They come to it and that adds color to that place. And then those bollards happen to be suitable. So that whole place has moved from an intersection for traffic two times a day, lunch and dinner, to a place for people. Another fellow who's a friend of ours who died not too long ago, but he, uh, he was a, one of the most, he was a highly 
competent traffic engineer who did a lot of data collection. And uh, one of his quotes is, the only way to make a busy road intersection safe is to make it feel dangerous. That sounds a little bit wrong, but it's not at all. Uh, because he would turn an intersection like that, uh, which is all about cars moving and turning and all that kind of stuff, into an intersection like that. And he took all the stoplights out and uh, so that people would have eye contact. He, he studied uh, the data so carefully that he could see what the speed needed to be of the vehicle for the pedestrian and the vehicle to have eye contact. And so what he did is he creates safer intersections than the dangerous ones that you have and we have all over the place. Uh, and when this, these two bicycles came, you saw them nod to each other, and the car let the bicycles go. So, and there are 27,000 vehicles going through that intersection every day, so it's not a little intersection. But the other thing that happened, we were standing with this Mr. Vonderman and, uh, on the street, and a bus driver pulled up, opened the door, and, and said, Mr. Vonderman, thank you for what you've done. You have made my life so much better. Because they didn't have to go through those terrible intersections, because they had more contact with people. They felt that they were part of a community rather than just separate by the, the kind of vehicles that they had. So the accident rates went down, it was safer, and he proved this in many other places. So then, uh, we have this guy who's a traffic engineer, who's the one that we went to to get a job to train traffic engineers, where in the interview to get the job, I said, what I said, I said is, we, we believe that, every, that whatever a traffic engineer says, you do the opposite, and we got the job to train the traffic engineers, because they wanted to do something useful for their communities, rather than be the Department of Community Destruction. Uh, so we put this guy out in the middle of the street, and uh, he stood there, and uh, the truck came by, and other cars, and he, is my, he had as much right to be in the center of that street as, it, as the vehicles did. So he was all right. But, uh, so then we said, let's put him in a chair in the middle of the street. <laughs> so there he is. This is a guy who's a traffic engineer. who His whole life was spent moving traffic. And there he is. And uh, he's still working. So uh, that changed his life. Uh, he, he totally, he, he saw it and it changed his life for the future. And he became a pedestrian or a human being again. So what Hans Monerman said, if you want vehicles to behave like they're in a village, build one. But also, it's a transfer of power and responsibility from the state to the individual and the community. That's a paradigm shift. So um, the characteristics of good public spaces, uh, good places breed healthy activity. These are all really obvious. And, and you can all have this presentation. If you, you know, you can People attract people, attract people. When you focus on place, you do everything differently. This is where you turn everything upside down. Uh, it takes a community to create a place. Amenities that make a place comfortable are critical. You can't know what you're gonna end up with, and if you think you have to, you're wrong. Uh, each place has its own identity. You can't have anything less than excellence. And excellence is such a big deal because it has such an impact on people's lives. People don't have places that they can thrive in. Their lives are diminished. So this is a big, big deal. Uh, so if you can't have anything less than excellence, it has to be a campaign. And so you develop the vision, communicate it, look for impediments, organize a strong team, attack complacency, produce short-term wins, take on bigger challenges, and connect change to the culture of the community. So now the people that you have to find in your community, we are always on a fishing expedition. And the people that we're looking for are visionaries with a poorly developed sense of fear and no concept of the odds against them. They are people that don't know what they can't do, but know what they wanna do is at the heart of that community that can make that community uh, a better place. They make the impossible happen. So we have people all over the world that have signed up as zealous nuts in their communities. Uh, this network that we're putting together 
is an amazing group of people. We think all of you should sign up. Uh, there are now 2,500 members, uh, and this global network is going to be announced probably in the next two months. And uh, so I want you to remember this, small spaces, multiplier effect. Uh, it's not just the number of people using them, but the larger number who pass by. These places are priceless, they're built of a set of basics, and they're right in front of our noses, if we will look. So remember that. Now, I want to show you something that blew us away. Um, quite a few years ago, Zurich uh, put benches out all over the city. They gave people a box, and they said, have artists design the box. So uh, they did, and I think there were 200 benches that were out there all around the city of Zurich for one summer. And uh, we took a lot of pictures, and we came back to New York, and we started looking at them, and we said, oh my god, uh, people are sitting in places where they feel comfortable. So these people look like they like mushrooms. And then <laughs> these women, that's the perfect bench for them, window boxes. I mean, it couldn't be better. And the couple there are want to be a little bit elevated in their lives, so they sit with the, that. And then, you know, this guy is clearly the pharmacist, right? It's right next to it. And that couple with gold lame, her with gold lame shoes, they're perfect for that. I mean, they should take that bench around with them wherever they go. Uh, and then this one on the left, oh my God, those, I mean, those guys are exactly where they need to be. Uh, and the one on the right, they put their pants on and came and sat on a bench that reflected their pants. Um, and this couple, this group, uh, looks like they <laughs> were painted on the bench while they sat down on the bench that looked like them. And the, and the one with the, the ball and the, is this, I, that could be some elbows on the ball, the kid is on the, bed, on the suitcase, it's perfect. And, uh, and then this is only these people would want that. So right there, you know, in 10 images, you see how people want to be in, in different kinds of settings. So to me, when I, whenever I think of a bench, I think of that, uh, and we cut all those pictures because everyone has their own qualities and they need those qualities to be supported. So uh, another thing, and this is, then I'll close, uh, these bollards are fantastic. They're not like these big, solid walls, but they're subtle. And so when you come to them, there's a sort of subtle way of, of being around them. In a car, you don't try to run them over. You know, you quietly go around it. Or if you're standing at an intersection, waiting to cross, you can hold on to them, or lean up against them. Uh, or, you know, just have a conversation with your elbow on. So it, it's turned the intersection from a place where you're just standing and wait, you know, nothing to do. You can actually socialize and have a conversation, and you may miss the next light. And so these are. This is a friend who's leading a placemaking campaign in Paris, but you know, this is what goes on. So then the next thing is that you can do is you can begin to think better about an intersection and about a building. So this is about architecture of place. They have more space outside the building than they do in to be part of that, of that neighborhood. And when you take and move uh, cars off and you move out, you can have the cafe have a full view of the street rather than a view of a car right in front of you. So uh, if we turn everything upside down in these areas that we're showing, you will bring community life to a much higher level and be much more impactful. And so this guy is out there with two trumpets telling us, let's get back to where we want to be. We're going back to the future. It is really about life and how it was led here 100 years ago or 75 years ago. 17,000 people lived in Riyadh 100 years ago. And I'm sure that the life they had was very social, very communicable. And then, uh, and then, so the strategies for implementation create these energetic act, act, anchors of activity, bring the inside out, Lighter, quicker, cheaper. One to four months is short term, and long term is two years. You need to get into a pattern of change. Not three to five years to do it as a design plan, a master plan, 
and then you won't do what you did, you go on the shelf. So you need to get into a rhythm of creating change and change for people to live better in your communities. That's it. Thank you. So we're going to take questions. I hope uh, that this was useful to you. And that you as architects, you have a much bigger responsibility than you ever thought you had, okay? Sign up for the Leadership Council. You're the future. I would like, uh, this is first uh, Jane Hamdel. I am teaching the Urban Design course. And uh, my students had the pleasure to join you last Friday in the uh, Al Futa district. Yeah, and uh, yes, they're a very hardworking bunch, and uh, they're keen to uh, learn more. Um, so your uh, guidance to them had much impact on their project, and I had already seen that yesterday in the jury that we. Uh, had for phase one of the project. And um, your input is uh, great uh, in regards to building their capacity, in regards to the power of people in making places. And I've always told them that uh, in the historic Arab cities, it was the people who made their places responsive to their needs. And let's recreate and go back into history and dig out the main concepts of why places were responsive to people's needs and aspirations. Uh, so um, uh, I would like to ask, please, in what way uh, they can join uh, your uh, uh, the great network of uh, place making, because now their uh, their current urban design project uh, is, or re urban regeneration project uh, is addressing the whole area of historic Riyadh, uh, exactly the area that you've been highlighting on the screen, which is from the, um, from the museum uh, or the fish market above the museum uh, right down to uh, Al-Basmak and Qasr al-Hukum area. So uh, they're uh, uh, very keen to join the network and uh, portray their achievements uh, in their project towards the end of this term. Great. That's so fantastic. You don't know how good that makes me feel because when you come here and you go into these three places that we we're working in and then you have people like that come and get excited about the potential, uh, we get very excited because we can see progress quickly, you know, lighter, quicker, cheaper is got to be what everyone thinks about. They're not big plans, not big designs. They can be done on the side. But I'm sure that because they're part of the, you're part of the university, and this university is the, the, the owner of the, the, of the, of the uh, you know, global of placemaking, I mean of governance, place governance. I want them to change the name to place governance and placemaking. See. So they, they should definitely be this. And, and the staff, the people that are working with uh, uh, Dr. Zahid and, the, and, and Marie and others are just fantastic people. So I think they should take this on as a project and then we'll help uh, do that. So, and we want to see progress. You know, there's an, imme an immense future here and the role you can play in that is phenomenal. And if you don't think so, you're wrong. <laughs> okay, come on, this is a big opportunity. This is a big time of change globally. And what you all can do is fundamental to that change. I'm gonna see that. We have another question. Hi, thank you very much for a very fascinating lecture. I'm uh, Jonas Vergadrega, I'm a researcher at uh, Harvard Kennedy School and we're just starting um, a research project now on regional development and smaller cities in Saudi Arabia and trying to understand both migration patterns and expectations of youth and uh, people living there. Uh, 
Um, I think your lecture was really fascinating. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the Saudi case and your uh, impressions from um, your stay in Saudi Arabia. As I understand that you've been here a few times before. And I'm wondering, uh, both from Riyadh and from other cities, where do you think it's going from here? Okay, well, try, let's do that now. You said Harvard? Harvard Kennedy School, yeah. GSD? No, no, the, the Kennedy School. Oh, okay. Kennedy School, sure. The, the, the public, yeah, School of Public Policy. Well, we've been working on Harvard Square, the Harvard Yard, and the Harvard Plaza. We did that plaza there uh, uh, by Memorial Hall, which is a major gathering place. Uh, so the Harvard Square, that's what you showed in the pictures, right? No. Well, no, well, it's another presentation. Uh, I didn't get to show that. So anyway, the, the picture you showed from... from uh, oh, yes, it was. Right, right, exactly. right. Exactly. That was just one image. Yeah, we have a little story about the whole that was, thing. That's, that's very good. I can, I can testify to that being a very successful place. Yeah. Uh, in the yeah. summer, people play uh, ping pong, and in the yeah. winter, they play curling. So it's, uh, yeah. Really See, the whole place is, was organic. We didn't know what we were going to do in that. But as people came into it, they began to ask for certain things. So, we, and it's still going on, but it's, it, it has grown through the community of Harvard and Cambridge to become what it is. And that, it's a very powerful example. I should, probably should have shown it. But the question that you had was, how do you see this playing out in Saudi Arabia? I don't know if we want to get into that discussion, but, um, you know, maybe there's someone here who has a way of, has an idea about how that might happen. Um, yes, there we are. We want to. really like to thank you for what we saw today. Um, when I first heard, and I was invited, uh, our students were invited to this um, lecture, I was thinking that it's probably a specialized lecture where certain people would understand what is happening. Mashallah, you did it in a way where it was amusing, entertainment, it was easy to understand, and it was to the point. We got, we understood it, and, and I thank you for that. It was an amazing lecture. What I want to, uh, to ask, and maybe our students would like uh, to know more, is that we understand that, that to have a, a place-making or to, to accommodate an area, you should see what the culture needs. So what do you do when you are in an area where it's multicultural? You have people from different cultures and you want to accommodate them all in one space. Um, is it uh, possible to do that, or do you try to segregate different areas depending on the cultures? Well, it, it, cultures are fairly easy to mix, but when you have singles and families, you're getting into some issues where you probably want to, like, like in, in the park, in one of the parks, there's this circle in the middle, and most of the center of that circle, there's singles. Well, we learned that this intimidates people, family and women. Well, what do you put in there, the center? You put something that everyone feels comfortable going into so that the whole center of the place becomes available for everyone. All different cultures. You know, it's, people are afraid of, of other cultures until they get to be with them. Then people realize that they're the same as they are. And so everyone is really the same human being. And when they get together, it actually is a richer experience and more fulfilling, and the best public spaces, you may be playing with someone that has a totally different way of life, and you don't know it. So that's what a good public space is about. It's about making everyone feel good in that place, and, ex and happy and excited. And so it's the ultimate way. So we don't come into a community and say, we're gonna mix your cultures. We're gonna make you inclusive. We're gonna make this. That's, that's a kiss of death. But if you create the setting, that to happen. All those things happen. And communities become more together. And they respect seniors, children. You know, it's, it happens in all kinds of ways where people, and markets, if you have a good park, a square, and a market, a local market, you can, you're doing wonders for, for that to happen. We happen to live in Brooklyn. 
New York, which is the, the epicenter of 153 cultures. So you get everyone coming, and it's just such a natural to be in that place. My favorite public space is the New York City subway. And what I want to do is ask every person in that car where their grandparents came from and what they did. And I would have the world covered. So the pleasure of living in complexity and is so dynamic and so fulfilling. And people realize that when they do that. So it's, it, people are drawn to complexity. They're drawn to this kind of life. Uh, they may be afraid of it, but, but once they start doing it, they're, they're, they're captured. And they may not know it for a while, but that's, that's how we see placemaking is, is the ultimate way without forcing allowing. Thank you. Is there a certain criteria for to be able to sign into the to the placemaking um, global network? Yeah, you, you go for uh, you go on to pps.org, peterpetersam.org, and there's a global placemaking uh, link there. And the other thing that's happening, I got an email from a, a, a girl, as she called herself, in Lahore, uh, uh, a Pakistani. Pakistan uh, earlier this week, and she was. She said, "I somehow found out about your organization, and I have decided that I'm going to make placemaking my life." And she's just graduated from architecture school, and uh, she's starting to to start a placemaking week, a discussion from the friends that she made in Lahore. I can share that email with you because it's a it's. it's wonderful. So, you know, you all could take this on and I guarantee you, you would be heard uh, because of the power of this idea and the growing power of women globally. And I really mean that last part. Thank you. Women are the future of the world. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting uh, lecture and actually uh, take me back uh, to the mid 80s and 90s when I was a student at the uh, University of Washington and uh, we're, we're at the University of Washington. Oh sure, that's a great yeah, place. And I was uh, Good uh, friends, working in a, a project one time, I remember a studio that we were working on and our professor, he was telling us that an open space in the university and I want you to work on designing these places purely green open space, there's nothing there. And uh, we were divided into teams, and, and then everybody, or every team started to put their scenario mm -hmm. for this space, uh, for observing people, observing behavior, analyzing behaviors, morning, evening, all times, weekend, weekdays, and so on. That was very interesting, and, and uh, we, we observed that there's uh, different behavior at different times, at different uh, days, uh, different occasions, uh, and so on. Uh, this really, uh, that, that really uh, make you think deeply of, uh, when you design a public space, an open space, you need to think deeply uh, of people, behavior, like uh, Lady had mentioned, uh, that you have to really understand what they need, what they use the space for, and uh, from there you can start to design place. Uh, sometimes you see very nice places, uh, like you have shows with these nice, very good slides, uh, all type of public spaces, open areas, uh, corners, sidewalks, and so on. Uh, but actually, uh, sometimes you need to uh, adjust this to different environments. Uh, to address your question, uh, you said this earlier, uh, I think we have to analyze uh, the cultural factor, uh, environmental factors that you have shown your uh, slide or your slide. Uh, in addition to that, I think the type of design for the urban area as a whole <coughs> uh, think in a very comprehensive way. Uh, and this issue has to be addressed. Uh, designing a public space, an entity by itself, without creating it in the whole environment, I think it's not going to succeed. You have to really connect this space with the surrounding area, connect it to the other areas in the city, 
so people, you know, they can utilize it uh, properly and uh, in a very efficient way. Uh, like you have mentioned, if you go to the city of Riyadh and the city center, there's some very nice spaces. But because of connectivity issues, sometimes some people, they don't go and use spaces because they find it's very difficult to be there. And, and that issue has to be done at this, the issue of accessibility and connectivity. Uh, I just want to elaborate at this point. And uh, uh, you, I think one of the ladies have mentioned maybe for uh, these kind of projects. I remember I attended a symposium of urban planning here so we, two months ago. Uh, and they were talking about forming a network, public space, public space network. It's a worldwide I think, network, I mean, not but it's a worldwide network where they can share ideas, creative ideas, and how to design space. I think for this kind of project, so really we maybe need to think about this one to form a network of people who are interested in, in place making, in design of place making, so we can. You know, make the place really serve the people. Not make it as a good design, but capitalize the process of investing much money and time. Yeah. Thank, you so very thank you. Thank yeah. you. So, in responding to that, and there are other questions we want to get to, but we, uh, Kathy wrote this book with me, but we had 11 principles. And the first principle is the community is the expert. And the second one is you're creating a place, not just a design. And the third one is you can't do it alone. And the fourth one is if they say it can't be done, it doesn't always work out that way. And that means that the professionals are going to get you some way or another because you're not adhering to their agendas. So, but with these zealous nuts, you get through that to where you can get an outcome that is really, and then it goes on. But the first principle was such a relief for us when you know we thought we were experts in public spaces. Well, when we said the community is the expert, we're free. We're free. So we can come to communities and say, well, you're the expert, you're the expert. How do we do it? What do you want to do? And they do it. And then we bring the examples from other cities, like we just did, as to what, you know, those benches are just mind-blowing. What happens when you do something like that? You know, it's those, those kind of tipping points that you're looking for where people almost said, ha ha, got it. So that's the charm of this. And if designers can get out of design into place, they can do that and create beauty at the same time. So there's, there's this one guy back here who's, who's going to get... It's like applying that you design with people, not for people. You design with the people participating yeah, right. in the process. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's incredibly impactful. And you can add beauty to it. That's what a designer can do, can make it beautiful. So that's where the future of design needs to go. And buildings are open and comforting to people and all that. So it's a big change. So yes, there's okay. something big. Uh, we'll take one question from the yeah. Yeah. Um, My name is Rahul and I'm a senior architecture student. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, interesting lecture. Uh, my question to you is, that have you ever worked uh, on other slum uh, areas and what is your recommendation for the slum areas? Because now in, in our uh, urban design course, we're working on the slum areas and we need your advice to, so we can work on it. Well, uh, you know, slum, you're talking about asking about slum areas, right? Uh, they are actually probably organized the best of anywhere because they make their spaces work for them organically and naturally. So they are in a sense a place to study, to see how that happens. Uh, sure, there are underlying issues that are more complex, but it's, you know, they uh, naturally, organically decide how to be in that place and make it available to people. Sure, there may be some hierarchies that go on, but they're, they're, they're actually better organized in many of the designed places that we have. And we're looking for something in between in communities where you can add some design that enhances more diverse uses. You know, I mean, just take a library and, and what could happen around a library in a, in a slum, you know, or in a, in, in a poor neighborhood. I mean, it's just phenomenal what could be going on there. 
that would bring people together and create that. So, uh, and then the library, you know, librarians are basically resource people. And, and resource people and, and, and hosts, if they become resources and hosts for the activity in that neighborhood or community, they really serve an amazing purpose. And then if you take schools and you diversify those, we live across the street from an elementary school, and it's a community gathering place on so many levels every afternoon after school gets out. You don't know what's going to go on there. So it's opening these places up for more diversity, whether you're in uh, a city or a small town. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Saad Sobhani. Currently, I'm, uh, I'm taking a foundation course at Princeton Columbia University. I like to learn a little bit about everything. <laughs> So would I. It's, it's like the tipping point from that book. I'm not sure, but I know the author is uh, Malcolm something. Anyway, it says, if I do that, I'm better off uh, in life. Surprisingly, one of my favorite cultures happens to be, um, you know, hardworking cultures like East, East Asian or Oriental yeah. cultures, Japan, China, uh, South Korea. What amazed me the most, they were literally in the slums. Uh, no, no, they got nothing, and yet, in the world too, and yet in this day and age, they are one of the most uh, technologically and architect, archi I'm not into architecture, but um, they are, uh, you know, they value hard work. And um, I'd like to tackle more on uh, the idea the young lady over there said about, um, you know, have one place for cultures to be. Uh, Anyway, um, just like one, one place, one place for cultures, you know, to be around. Sort of like a Sabarat Avenue. It's like one avenue built with Sabarat, with, I meant a bad and embassies, you know? It's just. I was wondering, is it uh, possible, um, like, to take just one big chunk of land, either in Riyadh or somewhere else, and, uh, like, make it just um, a place where you can meet other cultures from the world at the leisure of your uh, home? It's, you know, something like that. If you're curious about Canadian history, yeah. you, you, go, you go there. So, mm -hmm. like, um, I think it's also about that picture, actually. Yeah. I think it's about that picture, and it's just like, uh, yeah, I'm just going to talk about the camera, and I'm just going to talk about the camera, and I'm just going to talk about the camera, and I'm just going to talk about the camera. خلاص وصلت هي إنه تبغى يكون مثلاً في مكان في المدينة يكون ملتقى لل cultures المختلفة. Yeah, yeah, that's it. تمام. There's also another challenge because um. طيب عشان نسلح المجال بس لل في أسئلة ثانية نأخذ النقطة هذه ونرد عليها. آخر سؤال. Final question. Final question. So um, you know, you know, there's a there's a neighborhood built with the you know pack. Like has too many too many people, sort of like Al uh, Batha Avenue. It, it, it comes with a challenge. Like, where can I find a parking spot to park my car? Or, um, you know, is there a solution like um, there's a parking? Uh, you know, I can park if I pay some type of toll, some kind of toll, something like that. You know, like. Um, um, was that, sir, uh, was I clear? So we need a, we need a, I, I can answer one question maybe, but I can't answer all the things you're talking about. The parking, <laughs> yeah. that's it, the parking. But I'd like to go back, I, I don't want to answer the parking, but I'd like to go back to where you can mix cultures yes. and how you can do that. And in the, if you have, if you take the plaza, the, the square where the museum is, uh, uh, and you make that a cultural center uh, for different cultures to come, 
on a regular basis. That could be a place to do that. And uh, you could do that in the downtown library, in the, the central library, you could do that. So that it, you know, because that's what gives people pleasure, seeing how other people live and realizing that they're connected. Even if it's interactive? Yeah, like, um, like, if I want to learn more about American culture, I ask him directly. Yeah. Some, an experience like that. But I live in Brooklyn. And Brooklyn has 153 cultures. You know, and so my little culture, I'm a little person in a, in a sea of, of diversity. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's like you're living on the whole planet. So, so but thank you for your question. Are we going to get... Um, I'd like to know, there will be a metro station in Riyadh. How do you think of a streetscape will change in Riyadh? You, the, your lecture is about placemaking. Yeah. Uh, you took uh, streets as anchors of this placemaking. Right. right now, how do you see a streetscape in Riyadh? And then we are going to have a metro station in Riyadh. So the, how do you think this metro station will change the streetscape in Riyadh? I haven't seen what the results are yet, and I'm concerned about that because uh, they can either be enormously powerful gathering places uh, for multiple reasons, or they can be designed so that you really can't use them very well. And, and I, I, have a, I, I fear that. Transit can be a catalyst for placemaking. And, and community development, but if it's a catalyst just for development, it loses its both the uses. The fewer people will use it, but it will also not be another center in that neighborhood. People, neighborhoods need centers, places to go. And transit is a great place of building community around transit centers. So. When you get the disciplines that do transit, they, they don't get down to the people part of this usually. So I would be concerned about that, but I haven't seen any. And the word streetscape, uh, we like to use the word streets as places. So it's streetscape is a design solution, place making is a human solution with design. And, uh, and that changes the dynamics so that people are first in that. Uh, Hi, um, I'm Dr. Irene from uh, Interior Design Department, and I have a tricky question for you. Because we have a landscape design course, and sometimes our students say, but we are designing interior space. How can the landscape design consider an interior? I already have the answers, but what I really appreciate in your presentation is when you talked about the strategies that you are applying, uh, reduced to human scale, A-level design the city. Uh, so what, what can you say to an interior design student? How can she design a landscape? Considering maybe it's like an interior or no, it's just an exterior that it's different. You said, you're asking, how can you be a landscape architect and design for people? How can uh, a designer, and especially here our students are interior designers, so how can they consider the city as an interior space? I wish Kathy were up here to answer that question. Uh, I, my son and daughter-in-law are both landscape architects. My son went, but they both went to Berkeley. Uh, in California, and my son was telling me half the class was into art and the other half of the class was into community. And that was a kind of an interesting observation. So if you're into community, you go in a certain direction. If you're into art, you go in another direction. I don't know if that's a way of answering it, but... Yes, somehow. What? It's okay. Yeah. 
Kathy? I'm sorry. I had a major that combined. Combined? Combined. <laughs> Both um, kind of uh, interior design in the beginning and then environmental design and, and I realized it's a very holistic way of looking at the interior space and the exterior connecting them and the whole pro program was doing that very thing. Of course, that was like, you know, 30 years ago. 30 years ago. Yeah. Well, 40 years. But I'd love to talk to you more about that because I've been doing, I've been doing this for, well, almost 50 years, I would say doing exactly what you were asking. Yeah. It's been wonderful. And you have to learn to write about public space. You have to study public space. You have to do uh, uh, observations and anthropology. And it's just like a whole holistic way of looking at the space. And luckily, I was in school in the 70s, but I was, you know, it's a kind of, there was a foment in that kind of world then at the, I think it's coming back. Yeah, basically, what usually we say to our students is, we are designing for people. Yeah, right. So, if it's an interior space or a landscape design, we are doing the same thing. Yeah, so, right, right. your strategies has to be the same. Yeah. Well, you know, the best part of living, of my life, are watching the 20, 30, 40 year olds take charge of the future. And I have to say, in the United States, what's going on with these young people that are now in Congress is such a blessing because they're taking it over and young people that are looking at climate change and other issues and they're getting in all this attention and it's going to make the world a better place. So if you think for one second you don't have the possibility of changing the world, you are wrong. You can do it. And Thank you. Just a quick note to all the students and teachers who do want to be involved in this project. This, pro this week's project is really just the first, the very beginning, really, of a large scale placemaking initiative that we're very lucky to have partners like Fred and Kathy and their people um, working with us on this. And at the same time, you know, we're part of the university, so we're very open um, and we would very much welcome the students and the, the, also the teachers' involvement. We know where we are. Contact us by email phone, come to our offices. Anybody who wants to be involved, um, we would very much welcome sure. that. challenge is now the parking. 
Obviously, of course, the uh, uh, parking space, when you have uh, a, such a, a project like that it will be very attraction to the city. We're looking at it as a, uh, a project to really add it to the city of Riyadh, more than just for the university. But now uh, the discussion and the challenge is how can I have three different functions in the same idea and facility because it's going to be a big investment for the university and we already have uh, people working uh, with us on this. So we would love to see your <laughs> feedback on that. Thank you. Well, I wish I had shown the Harvard University project that we were on because there we mixed the community of Cambridge with all the Harvard campuses uh, to create this central gathering place. There was a picture in the beginning of the, of the show, which maybe I could just go back and show that, because that, you know, I can talk a little bit about back at the beginning. How, can we, how do we get back to the beginning? Because it's, it was really... <coughs> So this is the main square at, at Harvard. Uh, for Cambridge and Harvard, uh, for all the schools, and then if you know Harvard, there's a Harvard Yard, and one day, one day, they put chairs up. For 350 years, there was not one chair, not one place to sit, only John Harvard. And then one day, they put out about 500 chairs. And that changed the whole dynamic. Of, and then we're working on Harvard Square, too. So it was that, those three places have become more the center of that community in people's minds rather than just the physical center. So uh, mixing uses creates in interest and excitement, and managing uses allows all these things to happen together. So the most important part of public spaces is managing. So you're, you're sitting on a gold mine of opportunity. But the problem, I hate to say this, is that the disciplines are all lined up to deliver their outcome. And it will probably not be the outcome here. I, I've been doing this for so long. I, you know, I don't mean to say it that way, but uh, that's what happens. And I, I, you know, and I fear, fear that. But I also, you know, having been here, there's, this is a very uh, highly designed campus. But you could turn this, this part of the campus into a very social and well-designed campus. But it, you know, the interesting thing is if you go back out here where the food is, the people are all sitting in a place that has no design to support them outside. So, and you can do pockets of that. You can create little hubs like in front of the, uh, where uh, uh, the prince has his office. Maybe that's where your office is too. That whole plaza and the interior space there. Kathy was going looking at that and her mind was saying, let's have different kinds of furniture there. Uh, because it's all this kind of low furniture that only four people or three people can sit. But if you change that furniture, and you can change the whole dynamic of that space. So we'd be glad to, to sit with you for a few minutes. And go yeah, we would, oh, yes. But see, now here, uh, you have an open space more like. Yeah. But us, we have a very constrained, you know, we have like 333 meters by 1,000 meters. And do wonders. Well, uh, yes, we already have the master plan there. Yep. We would like to present it to you, but now this idea that already uh, imposed on what's already there uh, made us have to rearrange uh, the whole thing. You see, the problem is people over design. So if you bring the design down so that it has more open possibilities for change, you're actually reducing the cost. And you're now allowing people to come into that space and begin to figure out how to use it. The story of Harvard is we created that. You don't have to go back to that. But we didn't know what we were going to do there. So we 
we allowed different areas to start taking on different uses. And then they started to develop, and then someone else came in and asked for something else. And then it, it gradually became this, the place, not just, and, and it's a longer story. Maybe if we have time, we could share that with you because it is, it was a phenomenal impact in a very, uh, kind of an amazing way. We would never have expected to get what we got. But now when you think about, of course, the uh, managing traffics and the parking space, when you look at all those people, where are they parking their cars? Yeah. And this is a, a challenge also. Oh, it's all always, that's, that's the biggest challenge. Especially when it's in a downtown area, very attractive area. Yeah, very, that's, that's, that, that is, uh, you know, that you have to go underground. Yeah, but sometimes you avoid going to that place just because you know because you have a spot. Yeah, right, right. That's true. Well, that was, that's, our, that's part of a, that's a bigger discussion. But the main discussion ought to be on creating that really dynamic, and we call it the power of 10, where you might have 10 places in that corridor that you're talking about that all have slightly different uses that you don't quite know what they're going to be. And then you allow them to evolve, and you will have one of the most dynamic environments of, of any university. I mean, it's, this is what a lot of, we've been working on a lot of Harvard, we've been working on Stanford University and uh, Duke uh, and others. But what happens when you get out of the, I uh, apologize for saying this, in the landscape design mode into the placemaking mode, you begin to get the kind of outcomes where landscaping becomes a support to it, but not the defining force. What do you do when you live in a harsh environment? Harsh environment? You, I mean, that? No, no, wait a minute, you, wait a second, no, 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 I can challenge you on that, because wherever you go, people complain about the weather, whether you're in Alaska, where we've worked in December, people love to be in that weather, now, I don't think I would love to be, I don't want to love to be here, right, in August, in August, I know, I'm not going to come, but, you know, there are all kinds of ways, more nighttime, but you do, you, you become a wonderful evening, night time use, which then opens up all kinds of possibilities. And we've been to some wonderful places here in May, and it was pretty hot, that were very busy and very active. So, you know, we all get challenged by that, but we can't be defined by that. That's the key. So, and, and being challenged by that gives us an opportunity to prove that we can do something in a way that doesn't. So thank you. That's so. This is where you see what this happens. Is this gets to be really fun? This is where you have fun. You know, you're not listening to people. I'm glad that Dr. Yamani mentioned this, and I think it might be an opportunity for the university, as it has always been, to be a pioneer where actually they put the idea of place making before implementing the project. It might be an opportunity for somebody like you to look at the master plan as he has kindly suggested, and this will be for the future master plan. Yeah. But I think it was an opportunity, there is a great opportunity that actually I have also been discussing with Dr. Ivan in the beginning, is about the idea that you mentioned of your interest and Kathy about doing something for the current campus with the, That's the, way yeah. with the very simple things that might change actually the whole feeling of the space. It might be an educational program, if Dr. Giovanni agrees, that actually the center does it in cooperation with the uh, Department of Architecture, get the students and the faculty involved, and let us see how that develops. Yeah. A great place-making exercise within the university. Yeah, no, that, that's the perfect way to do it, because then you'll discover things that you would never have believed. And, you know, and we would not know, but we all could find out. So, and we can have you train your people to do it. Okay, I think we can have yeah. one more question and then we can close. Two. There's one someone there. And we'll take two questions. Do I see two? For a cover, you can continue to talk. An idea, if that would be possible. Why can't I just, this afternoon, I can bring my project and present it here to you. Yes. And then you can uh, elaborate on yeah, And we'll bring a couple of present. projects to you, too, where we've done this at Stanford or, you know, other places. 
Okay, and then we can invite all the, of course, our uh, students and faculty to participate. So uh, we can arrange if we can do it. I don't know if y'all like it, like uh, one o'clock. Do we have classes? Uh, because it probably will take 45 minutes, yeah. the whole yeah. concept and the idea and the whole thing. We can uh, just, uh, and uh, probably also get everybody here to uh, give us some their ideas. And yeah. uh, so I want to make sure then, let's just say, is it one o'clock, would it be okay? One o'clock, I'm sure it's probably they have classes. Yeah. Or, uh, Okay. So what? Two o'clock? Yeah. Two o'clock? Yeah. Would it be okay? Two o'clock? I can get the students with me. Yeah, that's all right. Great yeah, because uh, it's very important to have all the, our students, ID and the architect. Okay, that will make it two o'clock, please. Sorry for the short notice. I mean, it's not just <laughs> happened. Thank you. You yeah, this is two actually. Two quick questions. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, what's the relationship uh, of the landscape architecture on this place making? It's a meme or it's just a part of it, the landscape architecture? And the uh, second question, how, I, how can I take this uh, presentation? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, you showed us in the slides um, some pictures of um, a packed site in New York. Um, my question is, our site is also packed, but it's dangerous because of singles living amongst families. Um, how can you make it safer? And also, how can you encourage families to visit the site, knowing that um, they would get intimidated by singles being available there? I, I almost got all. Pardon? I'm not quite as I see it. New York City, you said something in New York City, right? Yeah, um, uh, the, pa the packed, that the streets were packed. So the, areas that, the, the area that we're working in is also packed, but it's dangerous because there's a lot of singles living um, amongst families. And if we, yeah, and they're non Saudi as well. So if we wanted to make it safer for them, and encourage families to visit the um, public spaces, um, then they wouldn't really, how, how would you convince them to come if there would be a lot of singles also um, in the areas? I, I think Using I, the public spaces. I, think I almost have your whole question. But it's about singles in an area, and where in Manhattan, or is it in New York? No, where? no, this is in Saudi Arabia. No. It's in the- Oh, it's Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's in the Fulton. She referred to a picture in New York City where it's, it's back to people. Yeah. She's asking if we have a case here, so we have families and we have singles. Mm -hmm. How can we have like, that uh, density of people yeah. that we have to say? Yeah. Them? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that the, the place where the, the central library is on a Friday night is one of the busiest, densest places. Now, I think you could even add more to that, more diversity, more uses that would even bring more people. and. I think give people great pleasure. I don't think density is a uh, is in the mind. Uh, crowding is in the mind. A good place like a market or soup is intensely crowded, but people don't feel de they don't is a cr very densely used, but don't feel crowded because they're closer together doing something that is an experience. So it's all about the kind of uses that you're doing in that place that you could you could feel crowded walking in a mountain pass and see someone and you feel like there's too many people. So you know there's a whole range of, of that. There's some really interesting writing on it that you would find good. But is that is that a, is that sort uh, of not really. 
the, the problem is that there's families living in the same area, but they're not using the public spaces because it's dangerous for them. Yeah. Well, okay, so we, when we were working on Alpha Tom, there's, there's some serious issues around uh, singles. And we think you can actually reduce that without getting them out by creating areas where they may have their own, uh, but when they're in the middle of the, the park, right in the circle, they're intimidating everyone. So by putting uses there, you can begin to, to, to diversify, to, you know, to take people who, in, to put them in different areas. The other place we worked in, it was just dominated by singles, and there was no place for women or children. Well, I think there are some places that as we maybe fix that where we can actually mitigate that and get that to change. And then you can even make it a little better and begin to, to, to make it so it's comfortable for everyone and not exclude people, you know. And when people, when, and I, this is a terrible analogy, but when we were working on a big park in New York, it was really dominated by drug dealers. And we replaced the drug dealing with other, with coffee and ice cream to be honest, and it diversified the use and people became comfortable using it. So there are, there are always answers for a particular user group. If it's just dominated by seniors, you know, that's a kind of, they, they, then other people don't want to come there. So that's, that's a sort of, and I hate this word, social engineering, but you, in order to get the full use of the place, you have to manage it so that it is available for everyone so that's, managing is critical. And those places are not managed and programmed in a way that it does give the comfort and, and, and positive feelings for people. So I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. Good. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much.